Welcome to part three. We're now going to be chatting about copy suppression and self-repair, which was the section led by Cody. So I'll hand over to you. What do we learn about self-repair? Yeah, so we talked about this a bit in section one, but I'll just go ahead and recap it right now. We found that copy suppression was actually pretty tied to this more general phenomenon called self-repair. Self-repair is this thing that was like first found in the IOI paper, then talked more about in the Hydra effect paper, where if you ablate a component in a large language model, within these same four paths, the model will compensate for this ablation. And the loss on a, an example will not, will not decrease as much as you might expect. This whole entire section is trying to use copy suppression as a case study of self-repair. Because if you get rid of copying, well, then you don't need to do copy suppression. Basically, at a high level, we first show that copy suppression exists in the IOI task. And then we do some more like high level, like matrix-based uh, analysis of where can we observe self-repair. And then finally, we conclude on a bit of a sad note saying that, hey, we still have a ton of questions that we don't quite understand yet, but we've made some progress. So uh, yeah, should we just like talk a bit about like why we think this exists in the first place? Yeah, and maybe like briefly recap what self-repair even means in the IOI context? In the IOI task, again, we have these like sentences where we have two names and like the model is able to like predict one of them. For instance, one such example is when John and Mary went to the store, Mary gave a bottle of milk to, and the model can predict John with pretty high accuracy. Concretely, how this happens is earlier heads in layer nine predict the word John, and then well, the word John gets predicted. But the copy suppression head in this example also writes against token John. And so even though it writes against it, it's not enough to actually flip the actual prediction. But what matters though is when you ablate these copy heads, which like copy the prediction of John, let's say that like they add plus five logits to the John token. And like the copy suppression head in response might write against it, like minus three John logits. And the end model prediction will be plus two John logits. What happens is if you ablate every single one of these name mover heads, instead of just seeing a minus five total logic change, you also should factor in the fact that the copy suppression gets ablated as well. And so you have only a minus two change in logics because, well, the minus three becomes a zero and the plus five also becomes a zero. All this is like a pretty convoluted way of saying that if there is no copying, we do not need to do copy suppression. Maybe let's disentangle that into two separate claims. The first is more of a behavioral claim. If you delete a name mover head and look at the total change on the output, it's not that big. Well, if you look at the direct effect of the head you deleted on the output, it is big. This is surprising. We can look at the direct effect because transformers have skip connections that skip layers. So you can just be like, if we just keep skipping layers and this head directly connects to the output, what happens? This is kind of surprising. And a trick question is, what's up with this? One mechanism is copy suppression. As we discussed earlier, conceptually, copy suppression can lead to self-repair because there's a big copying effect. It's suppressed a bit. And when you delete the copying, you also delete the suppression. So the deletion is compensated for somewhat. We find that this is part of, but not all of, the self-repair. I believe our headline figure is 39%. Yeah, so one relevant plot that we have here is a graph of the clean loaded difference versus the post-intervention loaded difference of every single head upon ablations of name mover heads in layer 9. So there's a couple things going on here. Let's break it down. Firstly, the loaded difference. This is a measurement of the correct token minus the incorrect token in terms of logits. The higher the loaded difference, like the more accurate the model is. And on this x-axis here, we're seeing the individual heads, how much they contribute to the logic difference in a clean run. So on the left here, we have our copy expression head, 10.7. It's riding against the correct token, as we all know. And on the right here, we have other heads that are in layer 10, but are riding to the correct direction. We ablate all the name of our heads in layer 9. What happens as a result is a lot of these heads dramatically change. In particular, we see on the left, layer 10, head 7, now starts contributing a bit positively towards the correct token. Uh, in reality, it's like you can assume it's zero, but the major point here is that it goes from writing against the correct token to doing nothing at all. The key takeaway here is that like this head and a couple of other heads are all positively reacting 
to the negative reduction in the ablation of the name mover heads. Because of all these heads becoming positive or more positive than they were originally, this produces self-repair and the layer 9 name mover heads are backed up. Just recapping what's in this graph, logit difference is our metric of overall task performance. Is the logit for the correct next name bigger than the logit for the incorrect next name? We've got this dotted line, and the x-axis is the performance on the task with no intervention. The y-axis is the performance on the task when you delete the key name of the head. If there's no change, a head will remain on the x equals y line. We see there's a bunch of small black dots on there. But if something does more after the deletion, it's above the line. If it does less after deletion, it's below the line. And we've highlighted a bunch of prominent heads that are above the line. We see that a bunch of these started kind of positive and became way more positive, and some of these started very negative and became kind of positive. Can you explain why L11H2 is blue rather than a negative head? Yeah, so we'll go into this a bit more later, but originally we had discovered like these two types of self-repair heads, uh, backup heads and negative heads, which were kind of like uh, qualitatively different ways of implementing self-repair. Originally, our definition was something like, oh, look at what the larger difference was originally, and then if it's negative, then it's a negative head, and if it was positive originally, then it's a backup head. But we were able to do like some actual matrix analyses to have like a more concrete definition of what a backup and negative head is. And so this actually ended up classifying layer 11 head 2 as a backup head as opposed to a negative head. We'll dive into this more later. I think it's worth highlighting this difference between negative and backup heads as like the first real sign that there are multiple mechanisms behind self-repair, that there's not just one answer to why does this happen. So we can think about self-repair more broadly as like the question of how do I restore performance? And two ways you can think of this as like negative and backup. Negative meaning that like there might be a component which originally is doing something negative, but becomes less negative when it tries to self-repair as opposed to backup, which originally may not be doing anything, but becomes more positive as a result of an ablation. This becoming less negative versus becoming more positive are like two qualitatively different ways we can imagine performing self-repair. And in our paper, we end up capturing both of these, both observationally and via like the matrix analysis. Within the IOI task, the negative heads are defined by originally attending to a token T because the name of do so, but writing against it. Whereas the backup heads don't attend to the token T at all, but upon ablation of the name of heads, attend to it more and thus increase the logits on T. What you've got there is backwards of what's in your graph, because you're saying negative heads look at the indirect object when the name movers look at it, which means that when you delete the name movers, negative heads look at the indirect object, Mary, less. Well, backup looks at it more. And backup copies whatever it looks at, so it stops looking at Mary and it's happy. Negative suppresses whatever it looks at, so it stops looking at Mary and it's happy. And it's like a one times one situation versus a minus one times minus one situation. And they all culminate in the final result of just self-repair. Beautiful. All right, what else do you learn about this? One of the, I think, more interesting parts of the section is the matrix analysis that we did to actually isolate what we think are negative and backup heads. The way we did this is by taking the QK circuits that we discussed earlier, and actually, instead of just looking at the QK circuit of one head by itself, we also compare it to an upstream head, the name mover heads in particular. And so the question we ask ourselves is, whenever a name mover head outputs something, does a downstream head attend more or less to it as a result? The interesting thing we find here is that we find a clear collection of heads that whenever the name mover heads output something, they attend more to it. These are the negative heads that we highlight here in blue versus another group of heads where if the name mover heads output something, they attend less to it, which we output here in red. And all this is captured via this equation here. And I think this is like pretty crazy because it shows that we can just like, from a very high level, run like pretty abstract math and like find patterns that result in predictable patterns within like how the head actually performs and behaves. And this is like also why, for instance, even though 
layer 11 head 2 is a negative uh, head in terms of like clean logic difference, it's actually just a backup head in terms of how it responds to the, the, to the name mover heads. So what's basically going on here is we're saying that whenever the name mover looks at a token, this makes the downstream head more or less likely to attend to that token. We can create a lookup table corresponding to a given token by taking MLP0 of the token embeddings. The token embeddings is a massive lookup table. We're just applying a fixed function to that lookup table, as we did last time. We can then multiply by the OV circuit of the name mover head. This says, if the name mover head looks at that token with attention one, what happens? Not accounting for layer norm. And then we can say, let's feed this into the query side of the downstream head. And on the key side, we can feed in the same token again via MLP0 to say like, if the name mover looks at Mary, how does that make? How does that affect whether the downstream head looks at the Mary token? And this is just a 50,000 by 50,000 matrix because there's 50,000 tokens and we can just analyze it. What summary statistic do you use on this matrix? I think we use various metrics for this. Uh, I actually forget the one we have in the paper, but I believe it's like the percentage of times it is in like the top one or top five rank. So like we take a column, for instance, and you would expect that like if it's a negative head, for example, then it will attend more to the token that the name mover heads outputted. So we expect that like for the same entry where the row equals the column, this index should be a very high number, meaning that like the negative head will attend a lot more to this token due to the fact that the name mover heads also outputted it. And conversely, if it's like very low, very negative, one of the lowest ranks on this column, then it would be equal to a backup head. All this yep. is like kind of trying to capture like how close is this full entire matrix to the positive identity or the negative identity matrix. I think that highlights most of the important stuff in 4.1 that I wanted to talk about. And where did the 39% figure come from? So we got this figure that copy suppression explained 39% of all the self-repair in the model. And this actually isn't too complex of a result. Basically, we're just looking to see what is the change in all the downstream components as a result of avoiding the layer 9 name overheads. And we take the individual changes in load difference, which is like the distance from every single head down to the y equals x line, and then seeing what percent of this is the entire self-repair. So like mm -hmm. for here, we find that this distance from the bottom of y equals x to layer 10 head 7 is 39% of all of the distances of all of these heads to the y equals x line, meaning that like any total change of logic differences Layer 10 head 7 accounts for 39% of all the change, which is a pretty non-trivial contribution to like all of software repair. Awesome. 4.2, why is the story more complex? The story is indeed more complex because we were hoping that this unembedding direction could help explain software repair in both negative and the backup heads. But it turns out that the unembedding direction is really only important in the negative heads, in these copy suppression heads, as we have discussed extensively in section two. The way we show that this unembedding direction isn't as important as they might hope is by manipulating the query inputs into the attention heads. If the unembedding, or here, the IO unembedding, was the important factor, if we were to project everything onto the IO unembedding, then we should expect that self repair wouldn't happen at all. Like if you only keep the IO direction and this is the important thing, then we wouldn't expect any self-repair. But if we are to remove the IO unembedding, which we think is the most important thing, we should see self-repair. We see this result a bit in our negative heads, where if we project away from the IO embedding, we see some self-repair, which is expected. But unfortunately, we also see a lot of self-repair that occurs when we project onto the IO embedding which we originally had predicted was like the key information that the head needed. And we actually see this across both negative heads and all the backup heads. What this means is that the IO direction is not the only thing that the head is responding to. And in fact, there are like other important things that the head is responding to that helps it perform self-repair and other things more generally. And so just to walk through exactly what we were doing here and why, the stuff we presented in the previous section is enough to tell you 
self-repair happens because these downstream heads are causally depending on the neighbors. This is kind of intuitive. The entire point is looking for things that depend on when you ablate the neighbors. But understanding causal graphs inside the model is a bit unsatisfying. What's awesome is if you can actually understand on a more fine-grained level how things fit together. Ultimately, the output of the first head, the name mover, is added to the residual stream, and then the second head reads in the whole residual stream and does some stuff. So if we can understand some directions or some subspace of the output of the name mover that mediates the self-repairness, this is a much deeper understanding of what's going on, and might help us get a better handle on what's going on. Here we had this story motivated by copy suppression, that the only communication happens via the unembed. But as we saw with copy suppression itself, it was more complicated than that. It wasn't purely the unembed direction, and indeed this stopping us from ablating that was insufficient to stop self-repair from happening, though it was definitely part of the picture. Anything else to say on self-repair? We have observed the self-repair in other cases besides just IOI. And we've also observed it in other models, but to varying degrees. So right now, I think like the importance of self-repair in relation to copy suppression is like there, but it's also an open question as to like how big is self-repair and like through what directions is it mediated? And I hope to get more progress on answering this question soon. I guess in that case, to just round off what I see as the most important takeaways here, we discovered this head that does this algorithm of copy suppression. Notice when things are copied by earlier components and do some post-processing, this head only does copy suppression, as far as we can tell, on the whole data distribution. And this is one of the first times anyone has like made a real serious attempt to understand a head on the whole distribution. It turns out that not only is this a thing that makes sense in the whole distribution, but it also explains the mystery of negative heads observed in previous work, in contexts where copying was the only correct thing to do, so copy suppression was always bad. It sheds some insight on limitations of causal interventions and automatic circuit finding methods, because it turns out this is also part of why backup and self-repair happen, and is part of the story of why negative components happen in general. And no, this is all in one paper. I think this is a fucking awesome paper. Yeah, I think we'll wrap up there. Thanks a lot to everyone for listening.